Would you welcome, please, Professor Dermot Ferrer to speak to Home Rule Back to the Future? Wakeus more, Philip. I was going to meet him at a grave. The on officer, my bet on show, and you. Courage, galere, dearly beloved. I want to thank Philip and Newell also for what they are facilitating this weekend. The power of communicating the music, the ideas, the talk, the discussion. And I want to thank you all, not just for battling the elements this morning, but also for being so welcoming for the spirit that was referred to there quite rightly. Uh, and that includes, of course, great hospitality, uh, great warmth and great generosity. Uh, and we're very grateful for it. And it's very important that we are in a museum, an archive. We're surrounded here. This is a memory room. We're surrounded here by reminders um, of 20th century Irish history and the pivotal events of 100 years ago uh, in particular. Um, and I want to echo the comments that were made about all the voluntary effort and other effort that goes in to creating these kind of institutions, to sustaining them and to ensuring that as many people as possible have access uh, to the Jackie Clark collection. I think it's a marvellous addition and has been a marvellous addition uh, to Ballina, but it's also a reminder that we need to stop and reflect and remember and try and draw some sense from what was going on in Ireland 100 years ago. That's why I'm so delighted that we're in this venue particularly. Um, exactly 100 years ago, the Irish War of Independence was becoming increasingly brutal and difficult. There was a terror, the terror of 1920. And we do need to think about what it was supposed to be for. It was supposed to be about sovereignty, about the quest for independence, about the quest for self-government. And you could argue very convincingly that there was a lot of success in relation to that quest for sovereignty and self-governance. That's why I want to reflect this morning on how we are governed. Of the 27 EU member states, there are only two that have managed to sustain parliamentary democracy uninterrupted for almost 100 years, Sweden and ourselves. That is a remarkable achievement, and we sometimes forget the most remarkable achievements. It draws to mind the stability and the depth of our democratic culture. This is a place that has been immune from extremism, as we understand its manifestations in other parts of the world at various stages of the 20th century and indeed more recently. We have a fair and free election system. There was nothing inevitable about that. There wasn't necessarily 100 years ago an awful lot of thought given to that idea of a stable democracy because that generation were in the midst of conflict, in the midst of a war. In 1920, Michael Collins was asked by an American journalist what kind of republic did he envisage because that was, of course, the mantra, the quest for a republic. And Michael Collins's honest response was, none of us have given that very much thought. And the reason he was being honest about that was because he had his mind on other things. He had his mind on military things, certainly, but also on survival and ensuring that there was some resolution of this Anglo-Irish conflict. Now that reluctance to define or to elaborate on what a republic might be was of course understandable uh, in the midst of war. But it was still a challenge even when the War of Independence was over and we had the Civil War. Kevin O'Higgins, who went on to become one of the hard men of the Commonwealth governments of the 1920s as Minister for Justice before he was gunned down in 1927, penned and articulated a number of overviews from his perspective of what the Civil War had meant and what it had meant for governance. And he memorably described himself and his colleagues as eight young men in 1922, locked up in City Hall, standing amidst the ruins of one administration with the foundations of another not yet built, and wild men screaming through the keyhole. Now that was a self-serving narrative in all sorts of ways. It was an attempt to try and almost dehumanize Republican opposition, attempt to depict them as irrational and lacking sincerity. 
But even allowing for that, it does give you some sense of the siege mentality that existed, the existential crisis that was there in 1922. And we did have that, of course, civil war divide that we still hear much about today. There were those who were inevitably disappointed with what Ireland became. Consider the views of Dennis McCullough, for example, a veteran Belfast Republican stalwart of the Irish Republican Brotherhood in the early 20th century as a young man. He lived a very long life, and he reflected in the early 1960s on what that period had meant and how he felt now. And what he said was, we lived in dreams always. I dreamt of an Ireland that never existed and never could exist. I dreamt of the Irish as a heroic people, a Gaelic people. I dreamt of an Ireland that is very different from the Ireland that I see now. Not that we were wrong in any of this. That was a reminder, of course, that they did not need to apologize for their vision, for their project in the early 20th century. But it's one thing, of course, to build on those dreams, to make those dreams a concrete reality. And what that was, was a reflection, an inevitable disappointment on what he felt the Republic had become, but also on what it had not become. So we did have that civil war divide, and we did have that disappointment for some, but we still had that remarkable achievement of stability. The peaceful transfer of power in 1932, the depth again of that democratic culture and the commitment to it. But did that come at a certain cost in relation to how we are governed? When I was a young student in University College Dublin, one of the great political scientists teaching at that time was Tom Garvin, as much a historian as he was a political scientist, and the combination of the two was potent. And he described the kind of state that Ireland became from the 1920s onwards. A democratic but markedly centralised state, rather authoritarian and secretive in style, and sceptical of the public spiritedness of the people it was to rule. The challenging, provocative, and I would argue quite accurate assessment. We might use a contemporary term, a democratic deficit perhaps, to describe what he meant and to describe governance. Are too many decisions made without an extensive, extensive degree of public participation? Are we talking about a closed system of governance, of interaction amongst elites, civil servants, party leaders, business leaders? Consider the weakening function of the Doyle uh, over decades. Was the role of parliamentary democracy replaced or displaced by cabinets, by courts, by tribunals, by even social partnership? Did it have to be that way? What was self-governance originally supposed to mean? That's where we have to go even further back than the Ireland of 100 years ago, to the idea of home rule or home government. The Home Government Association was formed by Isaac Butt in 1870, a loose alliance of sympathetic parliamentarians, sympathetic broadly to the idea of home rule, even though they hadn't quite defined what home rule was. But what they envisaged, of course, was a shift in the view of Irish civil society from one based on Protestant ascendancy to one that conceded to the aspirations of the Catholic majority. But it wasn't just about that. And this is why Parnell came to such prominence and dominance. It was also about the failure of Britain to grant reforms necessary to Ireland's well-being. Bound up with that issue of well-being, of course, were questions of land. The great crusade of Mayo's Michael Davitt, the formation of the Land League, the sense of the necessity of a social revolution around land and land ownership before you could begin to think about political home rule. And there were some developments in the 1890s that began to focus people's minds on the idea of self-control after the land war. The Local Government Act of 1898, for example, which brought local government to Ireland with the rest of the United Kingdom. Some way, perhaps, towards addressing many of those uh, urgent questions of control from the bottom up. 
This was during an era where there was an increased focus on the grassroots, on the constituency organisation, on the rural agitators, on the United Irish League, for example, of William O'Brien. And William O'Brien was sceptical of Irish parliamentarians in London, in Westminster, who were puffing on cigars in the committee rooms, in the meeting rooms, who seemed to be losing touch with what was going on in the ground in Mayo. And just before the first local government elections in April 1899, William O'Brien addressed potential electors in the town square in Westport County, Mayo. And he was defiant. You who up to the present, he said, have had no more power in your own land than the badgers in the Glen will now have the power through voting in the first local government elections to take control of the whole of the local government of your country. This is about a shift in control as he articulated it from the grand juries that have been dominated by the landlord class. There were many rhetorical nationalist assertions around these elections and with this change of guard when it came to local governance. But it didn't necessarily herald a revolutionary new mindset. It was one thing to be passing defiant nationalist resolutions. It was another thing to actually begin to deliver local government and all the financial pressures that came with that and all the practical considerations. There was, in some respects, the creation of a new oligarchy to replace the landlords, the very substantial farmer class who were very reluctant to spend money. And in many respects, nationalist resolutions fizzled out in favour of penny-pinching bickering. There was an obsession with rates and the need not to increase rates, not to be a burden. Many were also loath to give up the spoil system that was associated with local governance. Arthur Griffith was later to say, as founder of Sinn Féin, that it would be more difficult to put an end to favouritism and family influence in appointments under local bodies than to drive the British army from the country. The way the historian Ewan O'Halpin has described the development of local government at this early stage was that it was partly about democratising local administration without fully cleaning it up. And Sinn Féin continued to contend that it was its mission to clean up governance at local level throughout the revolutionary period. Now this was going to be very difficult at a time when Sinn Féin was attempting to supplant the British administration in Ireland. The War of Independence 100 years ago was not just a military war, it was also a political war and a propaganda war, and it had an impact in the context of local governance. The way Sinn Féin announced it in 1920, again 100 years ago, we must reinstate that derided parish pump in the national life from which a futile political generation expelled it. That was a savage criticism, of course, of the Irish Parliamentary Party, the constitutional nationalists uh, of that era. There were calls for appointments to be made on merit, improvements in health services, the provision of housing. But what came with Sinn Féin's control of local government, of course, were the loss of British central government grants for Irish local administration. There were many promises again around welfare during this period. Consider the democratic programme of the first Dáil in 1919, which articulated the first duties of the Republic to provide for the spiritual, physical and mental well-being of the Irish population, to ensure that no child would have to go hungry, to ensure that all had shelter, to get rid of what they described as the, pre the present odious and degrading foreign poor law system which had at its heart, of course, the physical manifestation, the dreaded workhouses, the hated workhouses. But we got different assertions and sentiments in private. Two years after that democratic programme, W.T. Cosgrave, who was Minister for Local Government, wrote a letter about people who were reared in workhouses. They were no great acquisition to society, he suggested. Their highest aim, he elaborated, is to live at the expense of the ratepayer. It would be a decided gain if they all took it into their heads to emigrate. It would be invidious to single out Cosgrave as having been particularly uncharitable. This was a Victorian generation, and they carried that particular legacy. But nonetheless, it was a further illustration 
of the difficulty of reconciling your rhetoric with reality. True, the workhouses were abolished in 1925, as were the boards of guardians, as were the rural district councils. Instead, we had boards of public, uh, public health and assistance. We had county homes instead of the workhouses. A euphemism. This was about, in some respects, continuing the system as it had existed, but giving it a new name. We had Irish self-government, but in many respects, we still had quite a British model. And what that revolution did generally was nurture a stronger desire for increased centralization. And you could argue that it was ironic that in destroying the home rule project that had been championed by constitutional nationalists for a home rule solution within the British Empire in favor of the quest for a republic, in favor of a more advanced form of separatism, we actually ended up with less home rule. Why was that the case? Consider the views of the great Irish historian, Joe Lee. After 1921, he suggested provocatively, higher civil servants in the early free state contemplated with Mandarin disdain the corruption and incompetence they associated with local government and crucially resolved to centralize administrative authority as far as possible in Dublin. Ernest Blythe was the minister with responsibility for local government in 1923. He quickly introduced an act which gave the local government minister the power to dissolve a local assembly, a local authority, if it was not cooperating, if it was being difficult, and replace it with a government-appointed commissioner. McCroom Rural District Council in 1923 had made representations about Republican prisoners during the Civil War and insisted if they weren't released, McCroom Rural District Council would refuse to function. The response of Blythe was that he did not consider any important public interests would suffer as a result of the Rural District Council failing to meet. Now that centralizing impulse is a very common product of revolution and the consequences are very serious. It brings us back to that overview provided by Tom Garvin. The idea of, of governments who are not prepared to trust the people with the power to run their local affairs. Certainly, Commonwealth Gael in the 1920s had this focus on cleaning up local government. They were focusing very much on uh, administrative and personnel issues rather than the sense of trying to expand the services at local level. They did introduce a local appointments commission regarded as a very positive development in order to try and ensure that people were appointed on merit. But they also introduced in 1929 the city management system. The idea of the unelected official with significant powers over local administration. During the Dáil debate on that in 1929, with Fianna Fáil now firmly ensconced in Leinster House, Sean McEntee insisted that this was a retrograde development. The way he put it was that a manager wearing the jackboots of the minister will be able to walk roughshod over their desires, over the opinions of the local authority. And yet, when Fianna Fáil came into power in 1932, they seemed to share that same centralizing impulse. There was a memorandum in 1933 that sought to justify the abolition of local government altogether on the grounds that it was a relic of British administration, that it had been used historically to try and further nationalist aims in the absence of a domestic Irish parliament, in the absence of the Doyle, but that now, in 1933, government intervention and supervision was feasible in respect of all national activities. The retention of local government, therefore, is becoming an expensive anachronism. And there was far too much intrusion of worthless and irrelevant political discussions as they were described into the business of local authorities. What it was contemplating was the complete abolition of local government bodies and the merger of their functions with central government. Now that didn't quite happen in the sweeping way that was envisaged there, but you could argue there were many aspects of that that were delivered on. Trying to counteract what you could call, I suppose, a bureaucratic centralization. Did it make a nonsense of what de Valera was to call that decade the standard of citizenship? Think of de Valera's rhetoric 
in the 1930s and the 1940s. One of his most famous speeches was the 1943 Ireland that we dreamed of. Now forget the cliched stuff about the comely maidens and the crossroads. Consider what was at the heart of that message. The standard of citizenship, the Ireland we would have, that citizens would enjoy a dignified life, one free from want, that there would be intergenerational support, that there would be an, independent, uh, an independence in things of the mind, rooted in a sense of home and community self-reliance. Contrast those very positive sentiments with the private views of his colleague Sean Lamas, who ultimately replaced him as Taoiseach. He insisted that the Irish needed strong central government to counteract what he called their vociferous tendencies. The Irish were just too prone to splits. Sean McEntee also elaborated on this, now a senior government minister. Too many Irish communities, he said, have a fatalistic attitude in regard to the conditions under which they live. And here's the nub of it. What he was really getting at was the idea, in his words, that the true spirit of local government could not be created by an act of the Oireachtas. It must spring from the people themselves. But it needed to be facilitated, of course. That contribution of McEntee reminded me of Sean Lamas' response to criticisms from the Catholic Archbishop of Dublin, John Charles McQuaid, about liberalising the licensing laws to ensure that pubs could be open for longer. The Catholic Archbishop was not impressed. Lamas's response in the Doyle was, men who drink to excess are responsible to a higher court than ours. As he looked upwards, he may as well have been holding a pint in his hand as he said it. So the true spirit cannot be legislated for, it must spring from the people themselves. And of course, you could always argue that there's an element of truth in that. But the next development was the management system being extended to the county system. This was regarded by some who were worried about Irish political culture and the direction of Irish governance. It worried them because as was articulated in the Bell magazine, Sean O'Fallon's Bell magazine in 1945, it implies a rather awesome admission of failure, an admission that we were not, in some respects, fit for self-government. And yet, there had been many reforms, many achievements associated with local government over the decades. Consider housing, for example. Pre-independence, the Labourers Act of 1906, generous subsidies to local authorities to build houses for labourers extended to urban areas under the Local Authority Housing Act of 1908. Ireland had more public housing than any other region of the United Kingdom in the second decade of the 20th century. And there was still an impulse there in the 1930s in the context of compulsory acquisition orders and more Labourers Acts, compulsory obligations being placed on county councils to provide for purchase schemes when it came to tenants and their houses. The bold defence of this in the 1930s was that any Christian state that bases its social order on justice had to have a strong public housing programme. Now from the 1950s onwards, the share of capital expenditure on local authority housing began to fall, fall at the expense of expenditure on private housing. Nonetheless, at time of crisis, there was still a very strong urge to address the housing crisis. Consider 1973 to 1977. In the region of 100,000 local authority houses were built. But long term, we seem to have lost the balance. We also need to consider wider welfare issues. The achievements. This wasn't just about local authorities. It was about the attitudes of state, church, and society. Consider what local authorities did in relation to the terrible rates of infant mortality, for example, in the 1930s and the 1940s. Kerry Redden, chief medical officer in Dublin, oversaw child and maternity welfare services for Dublin Corporation. Gastroenteritis was killing one third of infants who were dying during that region. This is about being more interventionist, 
It was about preventative medicine. There were oppositions to it. Catholic social theory emphasized the importance of the sanctity of the home, that it was unacceptable for the state through the local authorities to intrude on the private health and family matters of individual families, that there shouldn't be any legal obligation on people to submit for vaccines, for example. And this is also during an era, of course, where there is a great crusade in the 1940s and the 1950s to try and rid Ireland of tuberculosis, which was ultimately successful by the end of the 1950s. The reports of medical officers from the local authorities around the country provide us with a great social history of that period. Not just a depressing record of poverty, it's also about considerable achievement in attempting to tackle that. But there was still a very selective definition of home and self-control. Women, of course, were supposed to be at home. The official version of that we find in the Constitution that the official position in relation to women was that in the home they gave a support without which the common good could not be achieved. That was also, of course, about, it seemed, narrowing the options available for women. But there was also an irony in how the word home was used in relation to the development of the mother and baby home system from the 1930s onwards. Mother and baby homes as if they were there to provide sanctuary and comfort. And we have to consider, in the local context, who dropped these girls and these women at the doors of these institutions? Why were they created in the first place? What sustained the architecture of containment when it came to these institutions, which we've come all too familiar with in recent years? Well, the original idea was to take the fallen women out of the county homes because they were becoming a burden on the ratepayer. And it was always about the fallen women. One searches in vain for fallen men in the history of this area. These were all miraculous conceptions. There was a criminal language around them. First offenders, repeat offenders. A Department of Taoiseach memorandum in 1930 suggested that many unfortunate married mothers, unmarried mothers are denied the shelter of their own families. And that again went to the heart of what this was about. It wasn't just about local authorities or central government. It was also about church and society. The infant mortality rates in the mother and baby homes were appalling, sometimes five times higher than babies outside of those institutions. To take one year, 1930, of 120 children that were born in Shan Ross Abbey, the mother and baby home, 60 died. In Tume, in 1933, 42 died. In 1939, the Bessborough home in Cork had a mortality rate of 47%. To my mind, it brings us to the view of one of the leading trade unionists of the 1950s, John Conroy, who caustically commented that this country has become so Catholic, it has forgotten to be Christian. And that was about governance. And that was about reneging, you could argue, on proper governance. There were those who were attempting to highlight the difficulties of what was going on in these institutions, including Anne Lister, who was one of the local government inspectors with responsibility uh, for inspecting these institutions. In an unpublished memorandum, she insisted, these babies are our own. They are entitled to Irish citizenship. And that's still an unresolved issue. But there were other more generous senses of community and well-being. And it went to the heart of creative awareness. Consider in particular the libraries. Mayo came to prominence over a controversial appointment of a Protestant librarian uh, in 1930. But there was much more going on in relation to the public library system. When Erskine Childers introduced the Public Library Act of 1947 to take over the functions of the old Carnegie Trust to develop much more widely the sense of a county library scheme, he spoke about the immense amount of good that could be done everywhere in the remotest hamlet and up in the hills by an improvement in the library services. 
and he was correct. I was very struck by the memories of the novelist Dermot Bulger in 2012. He had lost his mother as a child, and he said simply, libraries saved my life. They were true centers of community. They were the last truly democratic spaces, as he described it, where everybody is equal. In libraries, we become citizens and not consumers. It's a positive assertion that still very much resonates to this day. But in the 50s and the 60s, there were to be more administrative and planning challenges. How do you deal with ideas of modernization and improving infrastructure? How do you deal with roads and housing and physical planning and the new demands that are there? These developments required, of course, new decision makings and arguably new powers. These developments were not matched by sufficient funds for local government or meaningful devolution. And there were critiques developing in the 60s, 70s and 80s about these ongoing failures. Tom Barrington, for example, of the Institute of Public Administration was caustic about what he called the drift to bureaucratic neo-feudalism. That's how trenchant the language had become. The extent to which far too many decisions were sucked into the centre. Where was local autonomy? The reason was that Ireland continued to adhere to its county system. But if you look at local government in other European countries, it was typically two-tiered. That you would have upper levels of local government representing a small number of counties or provinces that acted as agencies of a central government system. And then lower levels of local government where communities and municipalities each had local control or local options with considerable administrative powers. We didn't develop that system. There were occasionally nods in the direction of greater checks and controls. Section 4, for example, of the City and County Management Act of 1955, which was really supposed to have been used to uphold the public interest against damaging administration by giving power to local authorities, to councils, to override certain management decisions. But it was abused by too many to secure benefits, to secure developments which would have been refused by officials, perhaps for sound reasons. And consider the Kenny Report of 1974, which has been gathering dust for so long now, it must have crumbled. The idea in the Kenny Report in 1974 was that development land could be compulsorily acquired by local authorities at a small margin above its existing use value. It was ignored. No wonder the speculators and the developers were very content about that. There was also in that decade the abolition of domestic rates, a major source of independent income for the local authorities. And this development was embraced with gusto by the electorate in 1977. In the early 1970s, 44% of local authority income came from the domestic rates. Sean Tracy, a Labour Party TD, in discussing the legislation to give effect to that abolition of domestic rates, suggested it was a sugar-coated bill containing a deadly poison, a poison which connotes the ultimate destruction of the local authority system and the democratic basis on which it exists. More recently, there were further developments that you could argue are related to that assessment. In 2014, the Minister Phil Hogan decided to abolish 80 town councils. The number of councillors was reduced by 40% from 1,627 to 950. How much money was saved by that? At what cost was it done? Was it done at the cost to democracy? The number of local authority representatives per head of population in this country is one per four and a half thousand roughly. It's remarkably high by international EU standards. France has one for every 120 of its citizens. Germany has one for every 350 of its citizens. So the evolution of our system of governance 
leaves us with big questions. And I won't pretend for a moment that I have all the answers to those questions. But let me ask a few of them. What Ireland would we have now? What standard of citizenship do we demand now? What reforms are necessary now to Ireland's well-being to bring us right back to the original impulse behind home rule? A major European survey of 1984 on values and attitudes in the EU member states suggested that the Irish stood out because they had more of a feeling of belonging to their local region than to their country as a whole. And yet, as Joe Lee pointed out, you still had a gap between the culture or the cult of the self-reliant community and the stern realities of the centralised state. The argument was, if politics and society was becoming much more complex, then it was necessary for administration to become more flexible, or else bureaucracy would choke initiative. Today, 8% of public expenditure is at local authority level, compared to 23% in the EU as a whole. The financial crash of 2008 and 2009 reinforced that sense of central control, removing one quarter of the already meagre resources from the local authorities. It led to increased outsourcing, privatisation, and all the impacts that that has on housing, on water provision, on higher education grants, on public transport, on climate initiatives. Could you conclude that 120 years after William O'Brien made his strident assertion in Westport that we are still badgers in the Glen? It leaves that big question. How do you make political power and governance more Republican by distributing it more effectively? We have seen some initiatives in recent time that suggest alternative routes. The idea of the citizens' assemblies, for example, this conversation from below, this consultation from the bottom up. We have to think about this approach and this model, not just at national level, but at local level, in relation to addressing the common good. Because the common good, or what constitutes the common good, is something that has to be under permanent construction. It's difficult to find a voice in the swirl of globalization, of relentless social media and all the bile around it. I was very taken recently by the observations of the Irish writer based in Greece, Richard Pine, who suggested that the concept of home has become alien to us now in 2020. We are no longer at home within our own culture. We have become outsiders to ourselves. How do you counteract that? Public participation networks need to be taken seriously. Central government can still, it seems, do what it wants in relation to planning and housing and amenities. And crucially, the defining issue of our era, which is climate change. And consider the clarion calls around the urgency of climate action. They too are based on home. Our house is on fire. Our house is underwater. Now, if you consider going back to the impulses of home rule, not in terms of the structures of governance, but in terms of the sentiments behind it and linking it to well-being, you could argue, like the historian Joe Lee has, that it took England three centuries to mould Ireland in its own centralising image. But we continued to embrace it. He argued that intellectually and emotionally we conditioned ourselves to think English in terms of how we are governed. If we want to remake it in a distinctive Irish way or through a distinctive Irish image, we have to work at it. We have to raise standards of citizenship. We have to forge a sense of identity and community that fits our 21st century challenges and crises and also opportunities. But to do that, citizens have to have more 
authority over their own affairs. They need real home rule. Thank you for your attention.